You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and we're thrilled to present They Have Uncrowned Him, considered to be the Summa of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. Thanks to your support and donations, we are now able to release this as an audiobook for free, chapter by chapter, here on the SSPX Podcast and on YouTube. We are immensely grateful to all of those who donated to make this seminal work available for Catholics everywhere. We'll be releasing a chapter each week, and all of them will be available as a collection on sspxpodcast.com. Please keep in mind, you can also purchase the print copy of this work at angelespress.org. Now, let's begin. They Have Uncrowned Him by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre with the preface to the American edition, the preface, and the author's introduction, narrated by Michael Sestak. They Have Uncrowned Him From Liberalism to Apostasy, The Conciliar Tragedy, by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. God's plan is to sum up everything in Christ. That is to say, to bring back all things to one sole head, Christ. Pope St. Pius X adopted this same expression of St. Paul as his motto. Omnia instaurare in Christo, to restore all in Christ, not only religion, but civil society. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre Preface to the American Edition Angelus Press is pleased to offer to the English-speaking reader this masterpiece of Archbishop Lefebvre. They have uncrowned him. In this book, he points out the deep roots of the evil of our times, especially in the Church, the cancer, or better, the AIDS, which is destroying the defenses of the Church from within, has a name. Archbishop Lefebvre gives it its proper name, Liberalism. On December 8, 1977, he had already said, The fruit that the devil presents to the modern world to deceive it is liberty. Liberty of man set up as an absolute is indeed the cause of the weakening of faith in many, and even oftentimes the loss of faith altogether. We in America may have some difficulties understanding this. We have seen the church grow and multiply wonderfully before the council, under a regime of liberty. The popes themselves, Leo XIII and Pius XII in particular, acknowledge this wonderful growth. We are therefore surprised when liberalism is accused of being the poisonous seed in the council and the cause of this post-conciliar disaster. We would be tempted to relativize and say, This may be true in France, where liberals have fought against the Church violently during the Revolution of 1789 and throughout the whole of the 19th century. Freemasons have openly designated the Church as their target to destroy in Europe. But here, here in America, it is not the same. Such an attitude would lack clear-sightedness. The main difference is that throughout the Middle Ages, Christ reigned in Europe, but was unknown in America. From its beginnings, the majority of the settlers were non-Catholic, and thus America has never been a Catholic country. When the enemies of Christ set up to spread their poisonous doctrine in Europe, they attack the church even with violence. Their goal was to destroy the Catholic city. In America, there was no Catholic city, to destroy. We must heed the words of the popes. If the Catholic religion is honored among you, if it is thriving, if it is ever growing, that has to be attributed entirely to the divine fruitfulness enjoyed by the Church. This growth is thus not a fruit of liberalism, but rather of the grace of our Lord spreading through the dedication of missionaries, priests, nuns, and fervent faithful. It is a fruit of the traditional Catholic liturgy which attracted many souls by its beauty and universality. Moreover, the Pope continues, 
the church would produce still more fruits if it enjoyed not only freedom, but the favor of the laws too, and the protection of the civil authorities. Liberalism is far from being the cause of the church's growth in America before the council. Neither is it the cause of the temporal success in America. It is rather to be found in the natural virtues of its citizens, in the sense of initiative and leadership of hardworking people. Liberalism is certainly the cause of what we see today, the complete dissolution of the forces of our country. Is not abortion promoted under the pretext of the false liberty of women to do what they want with their own body? Are not gay rights promoted under the same pretext of false liberty? Is not liberalism what is weakening America's stand against communism? In the church as well, is it not liberalism in the clergy that caused so few priests to remain faithful to the mass of their ordination when the new mass came in? Father Schmidtberger has said, What we need is to come back to the spirituality of the martyrs. How true this is. The martyrs understood that man is not first. God is first and must be given pride of place in our life, in our families, in our countries. Seek ye therefore first the kingdom of God and His justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fidelity to our Lord Jesus Christ is a good even greater than our own life. The true faith is a treasure that we must not only keep for ourselves, but give to all around us, parents to children, priests to faithful, and citizens to their fellow citizens. The so-called liberal Catholics are ashamed of the faith, while the martyrs have given their blood for it. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him the Son of Man shall be ashamed when he shall come in his majesty. In order to have the courage and the zeal to confess our Lord Jesus Christ, one must have a strong conviction, a strong faith. Liberalism as Archbishop Lefebvre explains masterfully in this book, weakens this conviction and leads to its complete destruction. Let us come back to the spirituality of the first American martyrs. To sum up this whole book in one word, the liberals do not understand the first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind. Matthew 22:37 The liberals would say how can this be love if it is commanded For them the law is opposed to liberty and to love a law of love is incomprehensible for them Our Lord Jesus Christ's law is a law of love it is true love because we have the psychological liberty not to love God for we can reject him it is a law because we are duty-bound to love Him. We are not allowed to reject Him. God is the sumum bonum, the supreme good. His goodness attracts our love powerfully, but His supremacy imposes on us a duty to love Him. Every created thing compared to the Creator is like nothing. A finite thing compared to the infinite is as nothing. This is why our Lord says to the young man thirsting for perfection, God alone is good. That is, God alone is worthy to be loved. Everything else is as dust in comparison. Vanity of vanities and all is vanity. Thus the church teaches us to pray. May thy holy mysteries, O Lord Jesus, produce in us a divine fervor, whereby having tasted the sweetness of thy most dear heart, we may learn to despise earthly things and love those of heaven. The liberals have taken away this prayer. They no longer want to despise the things of the earth. True liberty is always in regard to inferior things. False liberty is in regard to superior realities. Liberals, wanting to be free from God, become slaves to earthly things. In one word, the liberals reject God's supremacy. They relativize it 
and set up a new absolute, liberty. May the Immaculate and Humble Virgin Mary help us always to acknowledge that divine supremacy of her Son, and that if there is anything good in us, in our families, in our country, it all comes from the divine goodness of her Son, who, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, reigns forever and ever. May we acknowledge this reign here below in our life, in our families, and in our countries, so that we may share it in eternity with all the saints. Father Francois Lenay, June 10, 1988, Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Preface The idea behind this work made its first appearance during the conferences on liberalism made for the seminarians in Econ. The purpose of these conferences was to enlighten the understanding of these future priests about the most serious and harmful error of modern times and to permit them to pass a judgment consistent with the truth and the faith on all the consequences and manifestations of atheistic liberalism and of liberal Catholicism. The liberal Catholics convey the liberal errors to the interior of the Church and in the associations which are still slightly Catholic. It is very instructive to reread the teachings of the popes on this subject and to ponder the vigor of their condemnations. It is valuable to recall the approvals given by Pius IX to Louis Voyot, the author of the admirable book, The Liberal Illusion, and by the Holy Office to the book of Dom Felix Sarda e Salvani, Liberalism is a Sin. What would these authors have thought if they had ascertained, as we have today, that liberalism reigns as master in the Vatican and in the Episcopates? Hence the urgent necessity for future priests to know this error, for the liberal Catholic has a false conception of the act of faith, as Dom Sarda well shows. Faith is no longer an objective dependence on God's authority, but a subjective feeling, which as a result respects all errors, and especially the religious errors. In chapter 23, Louis Voyot shows clearly that the fundamental principle of 1789 is religious independence, the secularization of society, and finally, religious liberty. Father Tissier de Malaret, Secretary General of the Priestly Society of St. Pius X, encouraged by the Superior General, has had the inspiration to complete and to organize this set of conferences and to publish them, so that this very timely teaching can benefit others as well as the seminarians. While this work was being completed, the most abominable manifestation of liberal Catholicism was being performed in Assisi, a tangible proof that the Pope and those who approve of him have a false idea of the faith, a modernist notion which is going to shake the whole edifice of the Church. The Pope himself declares this in his allocution of December 22, 1986, to the members of the Curia. With the purpose of keeping and protecting the Catholic faith from this plague of liberalism, this book seems to me to have come at the right time, becoming an echo of the words of our Lord. He that believeth and is baptized will be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. It is this belief that the Word of God incarnate has demanded of all if they want to be saved. It is this that cost him his life and then that of all the martyrs and witnesses who have professed it. With religious liberalism, there are no more martyrs or missionaries, but only rummage sale dealers in religion, around the peace pipe of a purely verbal peace. Far be from us this liberalism, grave digger of the Catholic Church. Following our Lord, let us carry the standard of the cross, the only sign and the only source of salvation. May Our Lady of Fatima, on this 70th anniversary of her apparition, deign to bless the propagation of this book, which echoes her predictions. Marcel Lefebvre, Icon, January 13, 1987.
Feast of the Baptism of Our Lord. Author's Introduction Where are we going? What will be the end of all the present-day bewilderments? It is not a question so much of wars, of atomic or ecological catastrophes, but above all of the revolution on the outside and on the inside of the church, of the apostasy, in short, which is winning over entire peoples, formerly Catholic, and even the hierarchy of the church right up to its summit. Rome seems to be submerged in a complete blindness. The Rome of all times is reduced to silence, paralyzed by the other Rome, the liberal Rome, that occupies it. The sources of divine grace and faith are drying up, and the veins of the church are coursing everywhere in her the mortal poison of naturalism. It is impossible to comprehend this profound crisis without taking into consideration the central event of this century, the Second Vatican Council. My feelings with regard to this are well enough known, I believe, so that I can express from the outset the essence of my thoughts. Without rejecting this council wholesale, I think that it is the greatest disaster of this century, and of all past centuries, since the founding of the Church. In this, I am doing nothing but judging it by its fruits, making use of the criterion that our Lord gave us. When Cardinal Ratzinger is asked to show some fruits of the council, he does not know what to answer. Whereas one day I was asking Cardinal Garon how a good council had been able to produce such bad fruits, he replied to me, It is not the council, it is the means of social communication. It is here that a little bit of reflection can help common sense. If the post-conciliar age is dominated by the revolution in the church, is this not very simply because the council itself introduced it? Cardinal Sunans himself admits, the council is 1789 in the church. And Cardinal Ratzinger writes, the problem of the council was to assimilate the values of two centuries of liberal culture. He explains himself, Pius IX, by the syllabus, had rejected without appeal the world sprung up from the revolution by condemning this proposition. The Roman pontiff can and should reconcile and adapt himself to progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. The council, Cardinal Ratzinger says openly, was a counter-syllabus by bringing about this reconciliation of the church and of liberalism notably by Gaudium et Spes, the longest conciliar document. The popes of the 19th century, indeed, did not know how to discern, it seems, what there was of Christian truth, and therefore they were incapable of assimilating the revolution of 1789. Such an affirmation is absolutely dramatic, especially when voiced by representatives of the magisterium of the Church. Indeed, what was, essentially, this revolution of 1789? It was the naturalism and the subjectivism of Protestantism, reduced to juridical norms and imposed on a society still Catholic. From this you have the proclamation of the rights of man without God, and from this the exaltation of the subjectivity of each one at the expense of objective truth, and from this the placing on the same level of all religious faiths before the law of God, and from this, in short, the organization of society without God, outside of our Lord Jesus Christ. One sole word describes this monstrous theory, liberalism. Alas, it is there that we truly touch on the mystery of iniquity. From the day after the revolution, the devil raised up on the inside of the church men filled with the spirit of pride and novelty, posing as inspired reformers who, dreaming of reconciling the church with liberalism, attempted to bring about an adulterous union between the church 
and the principles of the revolution. How indeed can our Lord Jesus Christ be reconciled with an accumulation of errors that are opposed so diametrically to His grace, to His truth, to His divinity, to His universal kingship? No, the popes were not mistaken when supported by tradition and assisted by the Holy Ghost, they condemned with their supreme authority and with a remarkable continuity the great liberal Catholic betrayal. One must ask, how did the liberal sect succeed in imposing its views in an ecumenical council? How did the union against nature between the church and the revolution give birth to the monster whose incoherencies now fill with fright even its most ardent supporters? It is to these questions that I will do my best to respond in these chapters on liberalism by showing that once having penetrated into the church, the poison of liberalism leads to apostasy as a natural consequence. From liberalism to apostasy, such is the theme of these chapters. To live in a time of apostasy has in itself nothing of an exalting nature. Let us ponder, nevertheless, that all the times and all the centuries belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. The Paschal Liturgy has this to say, Ipsius sunt tempora et saecula, to him be all the time and all the ages. This century of apostasy, without doubt, in a different way from the centuries of faith, belongs also to Jesus Christ. On the one hand, the apostasy of the great number manifests the heroic fidelity of the small number. It was like this at the time of the prophet Elias in Israel, when God preserved only 7,000 men who did not bend the knee before Baal. Let us therefore not bend the knee before the idol of the cult of man, established in the sanctuary and sitting as if it were God. Let us remain Catholics, adorers of the only true God, our Lord Jesus Christ, with His Father and the Holy Ghost. On the other hand, as the history of the Church bears witness, every age of crisis prepares an age of faith, a true renovation. It is up to all of you to contribute to this, dear readers, by humbly receiving what the Church has transmitted to us right up to the eve of Vatican II. Through the words of the popes and what I pass on to you in my turn, it is this steadfast doctrine of the Church that I have received without any mental reservation. That is what I impart to you without reserve. Quam sine ficcione didici, sine invidia communico that which I have learned without guile, and communicate without envy. Her riches I hide not. <laughs>